Uh, good afternoon. I'm Steve Orlands, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and today I am thrilled to be joined by my friend Kai-Fu Lee. He is currently CEO of Sino Sinovation, which is a company that focuses on AI. For today's purposes, he is also the author of a book that came out last week called AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. It is a must read for those interested in U.S.-China relations and a must read for those who are interested in AI. Um, as one who didn't know much before I started the book, I ended up knowing, I hope, quite a bit after. Um, Kai-Fu, why this book now? Uh, well, I've been an AI researcher for a long time, and um, I have worked in U.S. and China, and I'm seeing a lot of excitement and a lot of challenges ahead of us. And I've done AI as a researcher, a, a product executive, and an investor now. And I think AI is taking off faster than we think. China is becoming an AI superpower. U.S. and China, there, um, there are a lot of complementarity, and we face a lot of similar challenges, and there are a lot of um, approaches that could be shared. So I thought I had that unique perspective to write a book that uh, describes that. Is this something which the U.S. and China are going to cooperate on in the <coughs> future or compete on? I know everyone thinks about this as competition, um, but it really isn't. U.S. is stronger in research, China is stronger in implementation. So they could learn at least um, on, from each other. And also, um, uh, I think China is um, uh, building Chinese products for Chinese people, Chinese VCs funding Chinese companies doing Chinese products for Chinese people. American VCs funding American companies building products for the developed countries. The two don't collide. So it's not a zero-sum game, not as though uh, the growth of one side would shrink the other. So given they're in parallel, theoretically, this should be a wonderful collaborative opportunity. Mm -hmm. You focus a lot on kind of uh, Alipay, uh, uh, you know, the, the I don't even know what it's called in English. Uh, WeChat Pay. Yeah. Um, how does that kind of change the landscape for AI in China versus the United States, where we still are heavily reliant on a credit card system that seems mm -hmm. quite old and outdated when you're in China? Yeah, it's a uh, very unique opportunity for China to leapfrog. Uh, U.S. had the world's most leading uh, transaction tool, which was the credit card, but it became outdated. It charges too much, it's inconvenient, it's only customer to merchant. In China, with WeChat and Alipay, uh, anybody can pay anybody. Uh, we can do micropayments, and there are no fees, almost no fees. So the 2% extra charge is almost like a tax on the American economy charged by the credit cards. But re with respect to AI, now everybody, including uh, WeChat and um, Ali Alibaba, but also the, if you build an app, you know who your customers are and, wh and what they paid and why. And if you're a retail shop and people scanned you, you know who paid you and why. Um, even if you're, uh, there are even beggars in the street holding up a sign, scan me and give me money. And they know who paid them <laughs> and why. So I think this is creating a huge amount of data that will help AI. And how will it be used? Well, each merchant will get data with respect to his or her business. And uh, it may or may not include the customer's name. You may have to go to extra steps to solicit a uh, user consent. But in the end, if you're able to get user consent, you will know who came to your store, what they bought, um, on which day. And from which you can make s better sales projections, uh, product placements. But doesn't a credit card receipt do the same? Credit card receipt uh, does not give the same organized information, and nor does it give a channel to communicate. So if you came to my store and bought this book, uh, and I got you to sign up for my WeChat uh, accounts, I can send messages to you. I can say, we have a sale today. 
um, and uh, you know, so I see. It's, so it's the merchant as opposed to the credit card <coughs> company that has that data. That's right. The merchant has it. Uh, obviously, Tencent has it, um, and um, both can use it to data mine and make better uh, decisions that help the companies make mm -hmm. more money. Are but Tencent and Ali going to be the focus of AI development uh, in the future in China? They will. They are the two strongest right now. Uh, in the future, I think there are a lot of opportunities because uh, there are many other spaces uh, that are not contiguous to this, this space, the payment space. Uh, Tencent is very strong with social gaming and now payment. Alibaba is very strong with uh, commerce and now payment. But uh, there will be uh, healthcare, medical, there will be manufacturing, there will be transportation. So I think the, there are many other areas where new companies still could emerge with the data and the AI and the monetization. Who will be the leaders in the U.S.? What companies will, will lead that in the U.S.? Well, Google cur currently <coughs> leads in the diversity of their products, the amount of data they collect, and also uh, the AI expertise they've accumulated. After that, there is uh, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon. <coughs> so it's a similar situation, except that in China, I think the data collection goes a little deeper because the Chinese people use the phone uh, more aggressively for more services. How can we use AI to improve the U.S.-China relationship? Well, uh, the academics in U.S. and China are wonderful friends. If you go to NIPS or you know, one of the AI conferences, you will see that uh, the connections are good. The sharing is very open, so that could be an um, inspiration to the parts that may not be focused on it. And I think we could, um, I think the committee can publish more information that U.S. and China are not um, competing in AI in a commercial sense. Therefore, and also they each have something to offer. And that's why I wrote this book, to let people know uh, while the media and some politicians are focused on U.S.-China in the competition, uh, even terms like Cold War is used and described as a zero-sum game, um, but in fact, both countries are doing great. Uh, there's a lot of sharing. There's very little competition academically or commercially. So I don't think it would, we should continue to represent this as a, as a war. Ultimately, <laughs> though, your, your book, the message, I think, was more about AI and its future rather than U.S.-China relations. Can you tell us what that message is? Sure. Um, I think U.S. and China will be dual engine that propels uh, AI forward. AI will be a huge um, technological revolution, even bigger than industrial revolution. It will have a lot of consequences, create a lot of value and wealth, but also bring up, brings about a lot of challenges. The, I think one of the biggest challenge would be uh, AI's ability within a single domain to outperform humans in routine tasks. And that would lead to a loss of jobs at perhaps too fast a pace for AI to create jobs such as other technologies do. Mm -hmm. And the message is that the U.S. and China both confront the same problems yes. and that the <coughs> resolution of those problems are complementary, not conflicting. Uh, absolutely. I think um, this is not a China-only problem. Some people think it's robots replacing uh, assembly line workers. It's more of a China problem. But it's actually root, uh, AI algorithms replacing routine jobs, including telesales, telemarketing, dishwashing, um, and uh, Radiology, I thought, was a very interesting one. The radiologist, a highly educated individual, yes. is yeah. being replaced by AI. Right. That may take a little longer time, but definitely uh, their job is routine. Uh, most of their job tasks are routine. So when those displacements happen, how to create new jobs, how to um, tax the ultra-rich, or is that the right solution? I think the two countries um, at a policy front uh, should um, at least consult what the other is doing. Uh, I think uh, more countries should provide their best practices to be shared um, as far as uh, what companies can do, individuals can do, and what governments can do. And uh, what we all have to lose as humanity is much too larger 
than what any one country can threat to uh, another country. And which is ultimately the human aspect of it. There are right. things that AI, I like the conclusion, which is there are things that AI never can replace, right. which is the human, the emotional part of right. what life is all about. And you talk about kind of the, what went on in your life and yes. led you to kind of yeah. realize that. I won't give away to the audience <laughs> what that description is, <coughs> but this gives you a taste of what Kai Fu Lee's new book, AI Superpowers, is about. It is a must read. There's no way to say it any other way. For anybody who wants to think about the future of US-China relations or understand AI, you have to read this book. Kai Fu, thank you for thank writing you. the book and thank you for being here. Thank you, Steve.